Okay, this is a review of the sermon that was given on September 13th, 2020. Slavery in the Bible. Does the Bible support slavery? NBC News talked about the slave's Bible, the slave Bible, and um, gave some interesting facts that some slavers took portions of the Bible and, and made a slave Bible that they would use to teach the slaves to stay slaves. And because of that, people say, why, how, why can you believe in the Bible when it was used to promote slavery? Well, here's a little historical note that you need to know. In order to produce a Bible that they could use for slavery, they had to get rid of four-fifths of the Bible. They only kept 20% of the Bible. That's, that's all they kept. And so the question, when you have to change 80% of the Bible, when you have to drop 80% of the story, you probably really twisted the other 20% because the only way you can study the Bible is to study the Bible in the light of Bible. And so that right there argues for the fact that slavery doesn't support the Bible. Add that to the information that I've got Young's Concordance, and I, when you look up slave and Young's Concordance, it doesn't have the word because in the Hebrew Bible nor in the New Testament, um, there is no word for slave. You have the word, the better, the better word is servant. And so one of the things we've got to know about the law and about the Old Testament is that we look at the law and people look at the Old Testament and they look at Israel and they say, oh, well, Israel was a community that produced the law. And so whatever the abuses that we see in Israel were to be assumed to be in the law, that's why we reject the law. This, this, is, this, this is the wrong picture. It's actually the law that produced the Jewish community. And the Jewish community didn't always measure up to the law just like Christians don't always measure up to the Bible. The Bible is not a product of Christians. Christians are a product of the Bible. Deuteronomy 4, what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws which I'm setting before you today? That was the theme uh, at the end of Deuteronomy. If you fully obey all the commands that I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. Now, it's real easy for us to be critical of Israel, but one of the first things we need to recognize that in America, we have the highest prison population in the world. Israel didn't have a prison population. So before we go and become really critical of the Bible, we may need to take a little deeper look into it and to see what it says. Like in Exodus chapter 21, anyone who kidnaps another person and either sells him or still has him when he's caught. He must be put to death. Now, if America had followed this passage of Scripture, there wouldn't have been an African slave trade in this country. It wouldn't have been because they'd have been captured and killed. Um, that would be the point. Or how about this one? In Deuteronomy 23, if a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand him over to his master. Let him live among you wherever he likes and in whatever town he chooses. Do not oppress him. If we had done this, we would have never adopted the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which was part of the Compromise of 1850, when the country was leaving its moral foundings of the Founding Fathers. We're going to talk about that a little bit further down the line. We would have never done this if we were following the Bible. You see, most of the time when a person was in servitude, it was because he needed to eliminate debt. If one of your countrymen becomes poor among you and he sells himself to you, do not treat him as, treat, make him work as a slave. Why? He's to be treated as a hired hand. And the reality is, he was a hired hand. He just worked for half of what a hired hand would work for. Any, an uncle or a cousin or any blood relative in his clan may redeem him. Or if he prospers, he may redeem himself. Servants in the Jewish economy were paid. Now, if he had to sell himself, an uncle could show up and pay off his debt, and he'd be out of, he'd be out of servanthood. 
but even if there was no one there to redeem him, he could redeem himself because he got paid, he got paid half. He is to be treated as a man hired from year to year. You must see to it that his owner does not rule over him ruthlessly. And by ruthless, I mean, um, if he was killed, slave was killed, the master was killed. Okay. And the rules that governed if he was harmed, uh, the rules that applied to harming a uh, non-slave was applied to harming a slave. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free, and when he, you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your and your wine press. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Why? Because you've been had you've had him half price for six years. So when you sent him out, you sent him out ready to start his own business. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that. We put people on generation, a road to generational poverty in generational slums. Is our plan really better than Israel's, where if a person impoverished themselves, had to sell themselves, they actually could turn their situation around within six years, and, in that, and then when they hit the seventh year, they're released and set up for business? Is that so bad? Let's keep going. A thief must certainly make restitution, but if he has nothing, he must be sold to pay for his theft. If the stolen animal is found alive in his possession, he must pay back double. And they, we decry this, but any thief that stole had to pay back twice. So if he stole an ox and he got found with the ox, he had to return the ox, but he still owed for a second ox. And so he would be sold as a slave until that debt was paid off. That's the way that's the way the system worked. Okay. And if the debt was great enough to keep him employed for the sixth year and the seventh year, he was set up for business. Now is that so bad? We pay eighty thousand one it's years ago we paid eighty thousand dollars per person to incarcerate someone so that they can learn their crime uh, job, their talents, hone their skills as a thief so that 80% of them can reoffend after they get out. Here, a thief has to work for a guy, and after he works for a guy, he gets launched into business after, a, after a, uh, six years over. Is that worse? What can we learn? Well, it's easy to assume evil in someone else. And maybe we could learn from the Bible. It's really easy to be critical, and it's really easy to point the finger. But it's probably a, it's appropriate for us just to be humble before God and, and to read it openly. Second, labor is to be re rewarded. Free labor is clearly condemned in the Bible, and God rewards us for our labor. Three, the Bible does not condone what it describes. You see, in the slavery passages, you see men taking multiple wives, for example. The Bible does not condone multiple wives. And that's very clear out of Jesus' own mouth. Multiple wives is wrong. The Bible doesn't condone what it describes. It only condones what it declares, what it teaches. And so what we see here clearly is that money was a mechanism by which a person could discover freedom. If he had enslaved himself, he was able to make himself free by humbling himself and learning from somebody else. This is a, this is a very quick review, but I hope it's helpful to you, and I hope you enjoyed it.